All right. Randy, I think uh, all of the attendees have settled in. There's about a hundred and sixty. We're one shy, so we need one more person to join us so that we'll have a nice round number. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. We really appreciate your showing up tonight and, uh, and our speaker as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about the chapter business, such as, it is, such as it is, and then we'll turn it over to Ricky for the rest of the uh, feature tonight. Uh, oh, it's going to do that to me. Hold on. It's not advancing. There we go. Twist leaf yucca, that's our plant of the month. I was out uh, hiking on a nice trail the other day and uh, I really uh, love to see the native plants out in the wild. You really get to understand more about what kind of conditions they like when they're growing and where they like to grow. You can see this is in a lot of shade. This is twist leaf yucca. It's native in the Edwards Plateau, cross timbers and prairies and also in the western tip of the Blackland Prairies, but it's uh, very abundant in the uh, Edwards Plateau. Uh, hold on, hold on, here we go. Um, so anyway, and I also like this picture because it shows you uh, what a nice texture it is against the grasses. So texture is another uh, good landscaping aspect. Um, sorry, someone's texting me. Yucca twist leaf. So this is, uh, likes the dry shady rock gardens and, uh, beautiful flowers in the spring. You can see the stalk coming out for the flower. So it's really pretty when it's just a stalk. Now the deer will eat the stalk, but they don't touch the leaves. And as the leaves age, you can see there's a nice twist on this one leaf. So they get twistier. Uh, very nice thin leaves, and then in the spring, a uh, great pollinator uh, bloom for that. Anaqua. We uh, had a question the other day on our website about Anaqua. It, one of our uh, members found it in a nursery, wanted to know if it grows well in the Williamson County area. I'm not aware of one growing here, so if anybody knows of an Anaqua tree, growing as, as far north as Georgetown. Let us know, we'd like to go out and get a picture of it. I have heard about them growing uh, readily as far north as San Antonio, but also in Austin. And then I read on one website that uh, it can be planted as far north as Dallas, but it probably won't bloom for you very well because it'll get frozen back. So if you would report the location of this Anaqua to, you can get on our website or you can report to Wilco chapter at nipsot.org. That's up there on your screen. And uh, that's that. But the birds love the berries and I'd like to know if it's doing well here because as things warm up, uh, the plants from the south are gonna be a better option for us. Um, this, I don't really have any business because we didn't do anything over the holidays. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. I thought we could all use a break from all the Zooming around. And uh, I know I, I enjoyed not uh, actually not having a Zoom meeting. So that was very nice. But uh, I did think about what do we need for the new year. And in the new year, we would like, we have some projects that we've, we've uh, come up with and we need some support and it's not your usual, we need three people on this day for a plant sale. But this is more like behind the scenes, coming up with uh, drawings and banners and, and booklets and whatnot. So uh, I have listed several uh, skills. If you have any of these skills, if you're interested in finding, finding out more, you can contact me through the wilco-chapter at nepsot.org. We're looking for artists, uh, you know, watercolors of the native plants are gorgeous. I've, I've seen some from a lady in Houston, Mary something. Uh, and so we're looking to do some drawings, uh, editing. Gary could use help uh, revising the videos after the meetings. 
He does do some nice editing on that to make it a, a super video. Also just writings in general, uh, presentations and uh, plant descriptions. Plant descriptions we use on all our presentations and various uh, handouts we give. So that's always something we're doing. Graphics, if you know how to design uh, with a computer, do illustration or graphics, signs, banners, pamphlets, books, and of course, photography. What we don't need is, uh, what we do need is for specific events. If we say we're doing a plant sale on this day at this time, we'd like somebody that would go out and take pictures for us. Uh, we're often very busy with the customers and the plants and the tables, et cetera, and we forget to take pictures. So uh, that would be great. And also if we have a speaker somewhere, we'd like some nice pictures of our speakers out there given, uh, given their talk. And uh, we will also need some specific photography or photographs for our uh, pamphlets and booklets and such. So we're looking for somebody that likes to work really cheap. So as in volunteer. So uh, think about that if you have that skill. Publishing, we'd like to put together a couple of multi-page booklets with native plants in them. So if you have uh, ability to use publisher or even something higher end would be nice. Put together some descriptions and pictures that would be extremely helpful. Uh, that's one of my pet projects. Speaking, we're always looking for good speakers to give presentations on various subjects. We get requests in from different groups around uh, around the county to come out and give a talk to their, their garden club or the school or whatever. And uh, sometimes that includes a demonstration or uh, speaking to a, a youth group. So that would be very helpful. Videography, uh, we wanna be able to do more uh, with recording walks so that everybody can attend the walk just like everybody's able to attend this meeting and do some short classes, some different videos on uh, how-to videos, whatever, speakers, events, and then writing, just uh, responding to questions. We get questions on our, on our website as well as on uh, Facebook, et cetera, uh, different, you know, mostly plant questions. So uh, that's one area that you would, would uh, wanna know something about the native plants and just to compose some uh, postings for our, our social media and uh, talk about different things relative to native plants and landscaping and uh, conservation, different, whatever your passion is. So uh, if, if you have any of these kind of skills or desires, let me know and uh, we'll talk about it and see if there's a good fit for you. Mm, and that is it. Oh, also, uh, most of our projects uh, will qualify for master gardener hours. So, and we also get out there and dig in the dirt a lot. So don't forget. And that's, uh, we'll, we'll be putting out things this spring. I don't know if we'll have much going on this spring still with COVID still raging around everywhere. So probably won't be till the fall anyway, when we've uh, had our double shot vaccination. Randy, I have uh, just to give question? you a little bit of, uh, actually, it's answers to your question about Anakwa. Ah. Uh, I just wanted to kind of point out that okay. uh, we got a lot of responses. Um, oh, one good. from Lin Linda Reed, the, the Master Gardeners for Williamson County, mm -hmm. planted a few at O-L-O-T-R, which makes me think of Lord of the Rings, but I'm sure oh, that's I know not. That one. Okay. <laughs> um, what is O-L-O-T-R short for? Oh, that's, uh, that's a cemetery. Okay. I think. All right. Okay. Well, Linda Reed, I know her. Okay. Okay. And then... I'll check that and see how old they are too. Oh, thanks, you Linda. You need an example that's like grown up, so you know it survived. Uh, it's Our Lady of the Rosary. Uh, yeah, thanks, that's Linda, it. for yeah. telling me what that was. Um, uh, Gail Kriegel mentions that they grow at Bamberger Ranch. Uh, okay. She did pick up one there, but the deer ate it at her place, so not growing there any longer. Um, Dick Davis says that there are several at the Wildflower Center, which might be a good oh, okay. uh, place to get some examples. And then both uh, our chapter members, Agnes 
and uh, Nancy Pumphrey have them growing at their place. Oh, okay. All right. So right, asking you shall receive. Thank y'all very much. Well, I would say that uh, there would be no problem in seeing them in the nurseries is great news because they're a great bird plant. They uh, bloom in the spring, so perfect for the pollinators. And then the birds really love the berries. So that's wonderful to hear. Upcoming programs, we've got some great speakers lined up for the year. Thank you, Susie Hickman. She's been working hard behind the scenes. There's a lot that goes on to keep our chapter uh, fun and interesting and, and moving forward here. We're going to be doing Texas Native Plants and Climate Change. Uh, botanist George Diggs will be joining us next. And then Texas Native Perennial Border with Mary, Mary Irish. She's written several gardening books, uh, Landscaping in the Southwest and a couple others that are really, really good books. Uh, just enough Latin to go plant shopping. Uh, Carol Clark is going to, from the Blackland Prairie chapter, is going to talk to us about uh, how to decipher the plant names, the uh, scientific plant names, and then you understand a little more about the plant and also will help you when you go shopping for that plant to not just ask for that hummingbird bush, but you'll know you're, you're getting what you want. Uh, planting natives from seed, uh, that should be interesting as well. And then in June, uh, Leah, whoops, I didn't quite finish the slide, but landscaping with native plants. Uh, that one we just booked, and uh, she is a landscaper, so that'll be fun. She's going to talk about uh, how do you get started with your landscape with native plants. So great lineup, great lineup. I'm really uh, thrilled about that. So as you know, we're the Williamson County chapter. You can find us at our, on our blog, and this is where our best information is. You can watch any of our speakers that have agreed to it on YouTube, past speakers. Uh, you can also go to our Facebook and we have, uh, we post our meetings and, and our activities. We have somebody that uh, faithfully uh, puts, puts all our activities on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Instagram, we're not so good about keeping up with, but uh, to join the Williamson County uh, chapter, you can go to nipsot.org. You join Nipsot, and then you tell them you want to affiliate with our chapter. And I tonight we're going to be giving away this wonderful guide that Ricky wrote, Range Plants of North Central Texas, and. I want to tell you, I use this book extensively. I did a talk on deer resistant native plants, and I didn't want to just show plant after plant. What I wanted to do was tell you what did they eat and why did they, or what did they not eat and why did they not eat it. So I went through all the characteristics of a plant so that you could go plant shopping and figure out what, what the deer probably wouldn't eat if you didn't know for sure. But uh, anyway, uh, it was a great resource to look up uh, what the deer ate, what the deer didn't eat, and just characteristics of the plant and finding it out in the wild and uh, habitat and everything. It was really, uh, really uh, learned to appreciate that book. So in November, Jean L. of Georgetown won the Nature's Last Hope, I think it was, book. And so I want you to know that we really do give away a book. Congratulations, Jean, for last month. And Jerry, uh, Jerry, Gary will pick a winner, random number generator off the list of all the attendees tonight. And we'll be contacting you via email and uh, see if you want to uh, a copy of this book. And I, I'm kind of a late bloomer, but I got on Amazon and figured out we could also send you, of uh, most books, we can send you a uh, Kindle copy, Kindle as well as a hard copy. So if, if the book's available in Kindle, well, you could opt for that as well. I'm going to introduce our speaker now, Ricky Lennox. We appreciate him being here with us tonight. He's with the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, for 38 years and retired recently. He's a wildlife biologist, uh, 
over many, many central Texas counties and author of the book you just saw. And if you haven't already got his handout, you can go to nipsot.org, WP Wilco there, and pick up the handout, which is a plant list. So if you see a plant you want, you can just check it off. So I will get out of here and uh, okay, Gary. I really don't know how to switch over. No problem. I can go ahead and stop it. Oh, you got it. All I right. Do? Okay. Ricky, let me get you set up so that you'll be able to share. Maybe I need to figure that out. We need a practice session sometime. <laughs> sometime. Sometime. <laughs> All right, Ricky, you should be able to share your screen whenever you're ready, sir. Look, we're there. And if that, yep. uh, if you go to that link and can print that off, uh, it makes a pretty handy reference to follow along as we're talking. Because what um, I've got the plants organized in that spreadsheet, or uh, alf well, not alphabetically, but in the order I'm going to present them. And so it gives you, uh, you, can, you can just put a check mark by a plant if you find it really interesting and not have to write the name down. Uh, 50 shades of green. You're going to get the light version. This is about 40 plants. I usually do 50, but for the sake of time, we, we cut back some of the more common plants. And I'm often asked about the name of the title of the presentation. I didn't pick that. Um, I gave this presentation first to the Cross Timbers Native Plant Society. And the lady that writes the article for the newspaper every month announcing the presentations and who's speaking and all of that, she asked me what the title was, and I said, well, it's uh, 50 natives for landscaping, you know, neat natives for your plant, neat natives for your landscape. And she said, well, that's not very interesting. And I said, well, just make some title up and uh, we'll go with it. So I, when I saw the title was when it came out in the Daily Weatherford newspaper, uh, but I've adopted it. I go with it now, 50 Shades of Green, if you might relate it to that other movie, 50 Shades of Grey. Uh, first plant we want to talk about is um, Nuttall Milk Vetch, also sometimes called Buffalo Pea. If you're driving down a road with your windows down and you smell in the springtime a grape soda pop smell, you've driven past a patch of Nuttall's Milk Vetch. It smells just like grape soda pop. Has a uh, very you know beautiful flower, blue and white uh, lagoon type flower. It has, uh, the pods are about an inch long. They have a curve like a sword. And on the bottom of that pod, there's an inverted V, upside down V shape. So if you come up on a plant, you wonder, is that a milk vetch? Look on the underside of that pod and see if it has a V shaped notch. And if it does, then it'll be a milk vetch. Here's one of my favorite plants because it's a great pollinator plant, great seed producer, and nothing eats it. Cattle don't eat it, deer don't eat it. So once you get it growing, it's an annual, so it's gonna have to have a little disturbance from the ground to come up, then it will continue to come back on its own. And sometimes you see these pale washed out flowers. Sometimes this is the more common, the lavender with the white center. Um, it gets the name basket flower from these bracts that are under the flower. It's not a thistle. A lot of times people mistake it for a thistle. If you grab a thistle down here, it'll poke you. But if you grab this one, just like you see in the photo, it will not stick you, it's soft. But those overlapping bracts look like a woven basket. So we got the name basket flower. And I was in Hill County there in the Blackland Prairie on uh, a road where a water line had been put in for uh, going into the city of uh, Hillsborough. And I noticed that they tore up quite a bit of ground when they put that water line in. I was back by there about three, four months later, and this is what was growing, a solid patch in that right of way of American basket flower. You go back, this is a different site, but similar photo. You go back to about midsummer, and you can start seeing there's only one or two flowers still with the lavender. The rest of them have matured. And when they do that, one of the greatest joys in the summertime is to pull one of those seed heads, put it between your 
uh, index finger and your middle finger and take your thumb and just dig down into that flower head and you can shake out all of these black sunflower sized seeds. Uh, I guarantee you, you can go out there and find this plant now and shake out seeds eight months after they were produced. So it's good for wildlife and again, nothing eats it. So it's gonna be around. White prickly poppy, uh, beautiful flowers, always reminds me of a big fried egg, that yellow center and the white petals. Um, when I was working on that plant book and taking lots of photos of every plant, trying to you know just get them at different stages, different ages, I got to noticing, if you look right here, you see these sharp points. Usually there's three of them. There's one back here on one flower. There's one here on a flower. There's one here on a flower. So this is the flower head before it opens when it has these sharp points. If you look right here, you can see several that look like uh, a burnt cigarette, about the diameter of a cigarette in black. Well, that's the ovary that's developing. The flower that's set right here has fallen away. And if you know that, now when you see a prickly poppy, you can look and see, are there more three-point prongs or are there more cigarette butts? And then you can age whether that plant has just begun flowering or is matured and will not flower anymore. It's just producing seed. Uh, look at that flower. That's a great image of how it's reflecting. None of these were photoshopped or anything. This is just the way they are. But the way that light is bouncing around inside that flower is beautiful. Pollinators love to use it. Again, since this one also is not grazed by deer or livestock, so it's going to be around and available for the pollinators. You see a little drop right here. A bug probably bit into that stem and it's exuding out some yellow uh, sap. It's, it makes a yellow dye. You can actually use it for a dye. Um, and here's a trait that if you've ever quail hunted and you're walking through a pasture in the rangeland in November, December, January, and you brush by the mature dried stems of prickly poppy, notice that those pods are all upright and the seeds are loose inside those pods and they rattle. And if you brush against it, it will sound just like a rattlesnake. It scared many a quail hunter. One time I've been able to catch both a white prickly poppy and the red prickly poppy side by side. Uh, we also have a yellow prickly poppy out in the Trans-Pecos Big Bend region. Uh, and I think it can be found in South Texas as well. Bluebells. This is one of my favorite plants. Uh, it's an annual and it likes to grow in seepy ground. I don't see it eaten much by deer or cattle, uh, but you don't want to drive right up to it because you're probably going to get stuck if you drive up to where this is growing. It, it grows in bar ditches where water stands. And this is a pond down in Coleman County and notice that it's all, it's made a ring all the way around the pond. So apparently that pond has got some rock ledge seepage problems right there. But it's a, a neat plant. Carol Abbott uh, years ago helped form Nipsot. Uh, he described a method of two ways to grow this. One is just to, since it's an annual, once it produces seeds and matures, dig up the plant. And you're, you're really after the seeds that's fallen onto the soil and transplant that soil to where you want it to grow. That's one way. And then he also said you could take a, a coffee can put about two inches of water, like a three pound coffee can, put about two inches of water in the bottom, take a one pound coffee can back when they were metal, and you take a beer can opener and poke holes around the bottom, the triangular shaped holes to let the water in, fill that one pound can full of soil, press the seeds right into the top of the one pound can and leave them right on the surface, just press them into the soil, take a piece of window glass Put on, you put the one pound can inside the three pound can, put the window glass on top of it to make a little herbarium or greenhouse effect, and that would germinate them. But if, in all likelihood, probably transplanting the soil might give you the best uh, survival. Leavenworth Oringo. In the Blacklands, there's a shorter version of this called Hooker's Oringo, but I like this one. It's tall. Uh, you've seen this purple flower. You can dig them, uh, cut them off. They'll maintain that purple coloring for quite a while. At the end of every one of these stamens is 
going to be a seed, but each one of these is an individual flower. So there's hundreds of flowers on there and honeybees especially love to visit this plant to get the pollen. Now you notice the spininess, it's not going to be grazed. So this is one that you could have in a flower bed. It's an annual, so it has to come back from seed, but it's a good, good plant. It holds that color, that purple coloring for a couple of months after you cut it. One of the unique things about plants, and you get to looking at a lot of plants, um, back in the early 90s, I was, I was taking in a lot of quail crops, the, uh, the crawl out of the quail that hunters had harvested, and I was trying to identify the seeds so that we could work backwards and identify the plants that the quail preferred to eat the seeds of. And in the last month of the season, in February, when all the sunflowers, the ragweeds, all those other good crotons were gone, already eaten or buried in the mud, this white flower, this white seed started showing up in quail crops. And we couldn't figure it out. My counterpart, San Angelo, finally, Steve Nelly, finally identified it. And it is Lugnworth Oringo, those white seeds. Look at the straws. It's almost like a prehistoric seed, the way those, these straws are on the seed. But it's Mother Nature's way of ensuring something is available for seed eating birds in, the, in a hard part of winter. They normally don't drop their seeds until January and February. Water willow, if you've got a water backyard water pond, this is an excellent plant. It's a native. You have to be careful buying uh, water plants because not all of them are gonna be native Texas plants. But this one has beautiful flowers, white petals with these purple landing strips to direct the pollinators down to where the pollen and nectar can be found. And it transplants easily. Cattle and deer will eat this one, but hopefully you won't have any cattle in your backyard. Narrow leaf pacoon or fringe pacoon. This is an interesting plant, very showy, lacy, tubular flowers. But these flowers are not the flowers that produce seeds. These are just sterile flowers. A month or so, this is in late March in North Central Texas. Uh, late March, these flowers are out. About a month to six weeks later, small little self-fertilizing flowers formed at the axle of the leaf and the stem are what actually produces the seeds. So it's in this process of this type of flowering is clastrogamous. I never can say that right. So I had to write it there where I could see it. But it's a beautiful flower. It makes you wonder why it goes to that much trouble, that much showy uh, flower for no good. And here's the seed. It always reminded me when I'd see this in a quail crop, of a white of a knight's helmet, and they, they're always white seeds, white in color. So it and the Ringo are probably the only two very white seeds that you're going to run into. Whoops, uh, Indian turnip, uh, scurf pea. Here it is. These runners, these stems rather, lay on the ground. Here's one. I'm tracing it out right here, and then when they flower, they turn upright. But that stem's going all the way back over here. So here's one up in the air where it's a little easier to see. Normally five leaflets in a palmate manner. You'll, you'll see that the uh, flowers on the bottom, much the way blue bonnets are pollinated, the flowers on the bottom are pollinated first and it keeps putting on new flowers near the top and until it matures all those flowers. So you can uh, dig this one up and transplant it. One of the things I've, I've talked about cattle grazing, uh, deer. Uh, this one is a relish food that they love for wild hogs. They will root this one up. They'll leave the tops, but they eat the potato that's underground. And the Indians used to eat that potato, cook it and make a pound it into flour and make bread. Uh, funnel lily or funnel flower. It's a nice, nice looking plant. Here it is in scale with prickly pear. Here are the leaves right here. See that leaf's already been bitten off by a deer. Here it is in total, maybe 12 inches tall with a quarter for scale. It has a corm underground. So this ground level is about right here. So you have to dig deep to find that corm, but you could transplant these much like you can transplant the uh, wild irises. 
um, the filaments form a tube. They fuse together and form a tube. And that's always interesting, that shape right there. But notice the, the flower color. It's a white with a very pale lavender color. Here are the leaves again. They look like a grass. And if a deer was to come along and bite this plant off right here to get all those flowers, all you'd have left are these leaves that look a lot like the Texas winter grass right beside it. So you have to be on the lookout for this one. And I have, when I've seen them like this out in pastures, I have put surveying ribbon around them, tied a little foot or so of ribbon around the base. Uh, go back in a couple of months, the ribbon's gone. Or find a ribbon not tied to the plant. Deer come along and they're curious about the ribbon and they'll pull it off. A friend of mine saw them this, this past spring and they were making seed, sent me this photo. And then here's a photo of what you would look for if you were trying to harvest seed. Uh, very similar to the um, yucca uh, and rain lily for that matter, seeds, flat, very thin black seeds. Here's an unusual one, big root Cymopteris. And this is common in the uh, eastern half of the state of Texas, all the way out west to Abilene. The, um, this is the root. It has some micro roots that come off of it, but I didn't break any roots off when I dug this one. It's very unusual. This is a storage you know, for water, carbohydrates, storage medium. I, I cut it open and tasted of that piece that I cut off and it tasted a little like wet cardboard. Not that I recommend tasting a wet cardboard, but that's kind of what it reminded me of. Um, here's a couple of different ones. This is a young plant. Notice just a few leaves and one stalk and here's a more mature plant. No telling how, no telling how big the root is on that one. I dug a couple of these up, brought them home from out at Abilene and had them in some plastic three pound coffee cans and set them on a rock wall at our back door. And I was gonna plant them the next day or two. And that night we got a sleet, sleet storm. When I went out the next morning to go to work, I looked over at them and uh, sleet had filled the top of that coffee can and just a little bit of green leaf and stem and flower head was sticking out. But when I come home, uh, most of the sleet had melted. The plants never wilted down. They never changed color. They kept that grayish green color. So you think about a plant that's in North Texas putting up flowers in February, it's a tough plant. It's not gonna care about a little sleet storm. Now here's one you have to kind of put on your, your uh, really native plant loving britches right here. What I'm, what I'm circling right here is narrow leaf globe mallow. And here's some stems that have fallen over. Here it is in a bar ditch, cattle will graze on this. Deer will too. Well, deer will, cattle maybe not so much. Uh, but look at the flowers, lots and lots of flowers. And I see it in different colors. Here we have an orange or a salmon colored flower. Look at all those flower buds. Look at the leaves. They're folded like Maximilian sunflower and they're kind of a zigzag shape on the, the margin. Here's one that's sort of, uh, what, fuchsia? colored. Here's a mauve color, but it's all the same plant. Uh, if you had, if you could find the ones with different colors, it'd make an interesting arrangement. Uh, this is in test at the Plant Materials Center that USDA NRCS has in Knox City, Texas. And look at the, the flowers, look at the wilted flowers, look at the buds yet to flower. This thing flowers all summer long. So it's an excellent pollinator plant and you can see some little insects in there. The plant material center manager, the first year he said that they planted it, it flowered. So that's, that's impressive that it could flower in the first year. And he said, every time they went by and looked at it, it had some sort of bee, butterfly, bug, something in it using it. So it's under test for a potential pollinator plant to be released by the plant material center sometime down the road. Blue salvia, this is one you should have all out in your pastures there. Uh, flowers in the fall, September to October. If we zoom in a little closer, now you can start to see it's got a square stem, lots of these uh, bluish flowers, and it's making lots of seed too. 
uh, a unique trait with, to go along with that squire stem is it has opposite leaves, long, thin, linear leaves, and they rotate at 90 degree angles. So they're east-west, the next row up is north-south, next row east-west, then north-south. And here are some maturing seeds inside of these old pods here while it's still putting flowers on. And uh, it's flowering when the monarchs are coming through, so that's helpful. Here are the seeds, they're about an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch long, so pretty good sized seed inside of these pods. If you're gonna harvest this in the fall, you have to wait until those green colored, I'm gonna call them pods, they're really not, but the seed containers, they need to turn tan color and not be green for the seeds to be mature. Here's a more widespread cousin, mealy blue sage. This one cattle do not eat, Deer will not eat it. It grows on any soil out there. It can grow on the pavement if a car doesn't run over it. It's a tough plant and it flowers most of the summer. Uh, easy to grow. That's one you should look at if you're wanting a little variety of color in your landscape. Low Menadora. Uh, this is also called red bud. And here you can see a red bud, which this is the outside of the unfolded leaves. So. Half of these leaves have got red on the outside of them. And when they open up, they reveal a yellow flower. Here is the, the flower uh, that's matured into a brown seed container. And here's one that has paired seed containers. Sometimes you'll see this plant referred to as twin pod. Here's another bud down here on this photo. Now this is a, a low menadora that's not where deer and cattle have access. Here's a low menadora that is available for grazing. Notice it's only a couple of inches tall, but look at all the red buds. Here are the flowers. There's the seeds. They're in those pods, those round basketball-like pods. They're like lava rocks. And here's the flowers. Now, we use the number of petals a lot of times as a characteristic to try to narrow down a plant in its family. So here's one with five petals. Here's one with five petals. What's up with this? Here's one with six. And here's one with, looks like seven. And if you look in the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, North Central Texas book, it shows that this plant can have four to seven, normally five, but four to seven. So you have to kind of dig a little deeper sometimes. Let's look at a couple of plants here that have very similar characteristics. They're both, I'm gonna show you snake herb first, and then we'll look at, uh, getting the name right now, go forward. Hairy tube tongue, okay. So snake herb has got square stems, opposite leaves, and it has multiple pairs of leaves coming off at each, each spot. The flowers are lavender with darker, almost purplish dots in the throat. And this might've been the state record for Texas snake herb growing in Clay County, east of Henrietta, near the Red River, 16, 17 inches tall. That's the biggest one I've ever seen, growing in a bar ditch of a county road. So it didn't have cattle grazing, but could have had deer grazing. So it's a rounded mound. Both of these, snake herb and tube tongue, are both gonna be rounded mounds of perennial uh, beauty. Here is hairy tube tongue. Now notice it's also square stemmed and it has multiple pairs of leaves, but the leaves are broader and not as skinny as snake herb. Here are the flowers, pure lavender color, just some lavender stripes in the throat of the flower. And look at all the hairs that it has on the stem. So the broader leaf, the more solid color flower, that's the way you can tell hairy tube tongue from the skinnier leafed snake herb, but they're both excellent plants. White rosin weed. This one will grow in caliche. It'll grow in the white limestone. If they, if they knock the top off of a hill on a road and you see the white limestone on either side of the road, this plant will grow there. The leaves are very sandpapery, almost like 80 grit sandpaper, and they'll be a foot long, huge leaves. So white rosin weed, here's the flower. White rosin weed's normally gonna be 24, 28 inches tall with most of the flowers near the top. The better looking cousin to this plant that I like better, and if you read Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac, he talks about compass plant. 
and compass plant has yellow flowers and both they're both in the sylphium genus and a unique trait to that genus is only the wraith petals, the outside petals make seeds. The inner disc petals do not produce seeds. So you're only looking for seeds around the perimeter. But notice how uh, compass plant has stalks, uh, flower heads all up and down, not just at the top. That's another difference. White flower versus yellow flower. Notice a little drop of uh, white clear rosin that's come out of the plant. The Native American children taught these children of the settlers that you could gather this and use it like chewing gum. So they did, they did chew it. It gets the name compass plant because I'm shooting into a setting sun. I'm, I'm looking from the east toward the west and you can see the leaves are oriented to where they get morning sun and afternoon sun, but they're up, upright and vertical during the hot noon time. So they're not losing a lot of moisture to the midday sun and they orient themselves north and south. So that's a compass for a lot of, a lot of the settlers. Can get six, seven feet tall, produces quite a bit of seed. This uh, spot right here is on the roadside of Interstate 20, uh, east of Weatherford. And we had to put some uh, lath stakes and surveying ribbon around about a dozen plants to keep the highway department from shredding it, uh, or a contractor from shredding it. And as long as we left the stakes up, they did leave it alone. And we got two seed harvest off of it, uh, so it's, but I can't dig anything there because there's old asphalt broken up. You just can't dig down. We could hardly drive the stakes in the ground to put the surveying tape on. Inside every one of those flower heads, when we harvested the seed out, these little rosin, I call them diamonds, they're little crystal, you know, they look like crystals or just rosin droplets, but they're all in those flower heads as well as being in the stems. Interesting feature there. Balsam gourd. I wanted to show you this one first before we look at the, the fruit. Here's the flower with the developing ovary, an inferior ovary below the flower uh, of this plant. It twines along, climbs up on trees, climbs fences. The, once, the, once it's flowered and that ovary begins growing, the early growth, it looks like a black diamond watermelon, green striped watermelon. It's only about the size of a golf ball. Then it goes to turning yellow orange and eventually bright red. Um, I tasted the fruit of the pulp of this one one time to see if a quail would break it open when they eat the seeds. It's, it's full of mucus. So it's not, it's not really uh, appetizing. Didn't taste all that good. A unique thing about this plant, if you take one of these leaves right here and you uh, put it in your hand, palm your hand and you just crush it with your fingers it will sound just like the old commercial for the cereal. Uh, what was the cereal that did the snap, crackle, pop? Uh, Rice Krispies. It sounds just like that. Here's one of my favorite bar ditch plants. I say bar ditch because you don't usually find it out in the pastures unless it's a well-managed, well-grazed pasture, half shrub sundrop. The forward raked teeth on the leaves are a good clue that you're going to, even before it flowers, that you're going to find half shrub sundrop. In Texas, we have two sub varieties or subspecies. One that traditionally has a yellow stigma right here called Berlandiria, and then one that sometimes, but not always, but sometimes has a black stigma and either red or black at the base of a four petals. And that one's the, this Penifolius. So this is, uh, I think, the more common one across Texas. This one's sort of rare in North Central Texas. Now, if you're walking across a pasture and all of a sudden you catch the whiff of lemon pledge, you remember from your mother using it to polish that wooden coffee table, that lemony pledge smell is exactly the smell you get if you disturb mock pennyroyal. Here we are looking at it down low to the ground sideways. These leaves are at, ma at max a half inch long. They're not very big. Look at it from above looking down and this is that view when you're looking and trying to figure what is that smell? 
and the tiny little lavender flowers haven't opened up yet. But these, this is mock pennyroyal. Excellent little plant to uh, find. I don't know how easy it is to transplant it. I've never tried it. Cattle and deer don't seem to bother it, but it definitely has a lemon pledge smell. Now we get into some, some of our showy wildflowers, golden dahlia. Uh, when the sun's coming up or setting, this one just shines. It is uh, a golden colored flower. Uh, much like all of these uh, legumes, they develop from the base of the flower head and expand upward. And as they do, the flowers follow. And the pollinators have got a you know, long time, several months to, or a couple of months to use this flower. Here's another one called purple prairie clover, another dahlia that has uh, you know, multi-stem growth, much like the golden dahlia and it has the bright purple flowers. There's also a white prairie clover that you'll see it looks very similar, it's just, it's just white. But these are all good pollinator plants as well as being beautiful. However, they are eaten by cattle and they are eaten by deer. Rock daisy, common plant, grows everywhere. Grows in any soil, flowers from spring to frost. Uh, it's, it should be used more in our landscaping, you know, what, eight inches tall maybe? forming a uh, ever widening mound, but it, it's not aggressive. It's not invasive. It will grow on some pretty harsh soils. Um, all around good wildlife plant for landscaping. Uh, rock daisy, you, you'll often see it as Plains Blackfoot Daisy. And if you pull apart one of these flower heads, it's pretty mature. And if you trace down to the very bottom of that white petal, the petal bends and it looks like a foot and that's where it gets the name Blackfoot Daisy. Now look at this gray one right here. If you Back before you got into natives and you landscaped with an uh, introduced perennial called Dusty Miller, why not use a native perennial that would be just as good? So let's talk about Mexican sagewort. Sometimes you'll see it written as Louisiana sagewort. Same plant. Look at the very pronounced veins on the underside of these leaves. Gray, uh, very hairy, small, minute hairs. And to me, this plant's, if you smell of it, it smells like chrysanthemums. It has flowers because it's able to reproduce by seed, but they're not very showy. They're not very big. So normally it reproduces by underground rhizomes and it's not aggressive. It pretty well stays where it is. It's a nice plant. Erect dayflower, also called widow's tears, because if you squeeze this little curved part right here that's called a spathe, a drop or two of clear glycerin-like liquid will drip, drip out, and it got the name widow's tears. Uh, the Dutch botanist Linnaeus named this plant after three brothers whose last name was Chameleon, and one of the they were all three botanists. And one of the brothers died young. The other two went on and discovered a lot of plants and did well in the botany world. And Linnaeus said this plant reminded him of those three brothers. And you might wonder why, unless you know that there is a third flat petal on the bottom that does not develop. And, it, and Linnaeus was spot on, you know, two showy petals that went on and discovered a lot of plants. One brother that didn't make it. Now, I mentioned Dale Rollins earlier. I worked with him a lot before he retired and still do. Uh, he coined this phrase, the bar ditch palatability test. And I'm gonna give you training on it right now and you're free to use this from here on. He said, you would look in the bar ditch. And I'm standing in the bar ditch, the, the gravel roads behind me, there's the fence in front. And in between is a whole lot of erect day flower. But look across the fence, you don't see any. So if you see a plant in a bar ditch that you think might have might be palatable and you don't see it across the fence where it's being grazed, then that plant passes the bar ditch palatability test. You might have thought this was a weed growing in a crack in your sidewalk, but it's a very palatable plant grazed by cattle, sheep, goats, deer, horses, everything that likes to eat plants. Narrow leaf gay feather. Uh, this is a, a pretty good pollinator plant because it flowers late in the fall when after most of the other plants have flowered. 
has those purple spikes that show up about the time hunting season starts. Deer and cattle, mainly deer, but they will graze on this. And if they bite these stems off early in the year, like in May or June maybe, this plant will grow three or four new shoots off that bitten off stem and it can still flower. But if it does it late, July, August, it won't have time to regrow those stems. But I took this picture on the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch between Roby and Snyder in 2011, the last Friday of September, the next, well, it was the last Thursday because the last Friday is when they had their field day. There were, monarchs were migrating through, but there were no other flowering plants because if you remember the, throughout the summer and the fall of 2011, we were in a bad drought, but the monarchs were nectaring up and the queens were nectaring up on narrow leaf gay feather. And uh, once I saw a white gay feather out in the pasture. This is a road cut on a ranch. You can see the roots of two narrow leaf gay feathers. It, quite a bit of root exposed. You might wonder, well, how can that plant stay green and healthy with that much root exposed? But this is a, a drawing from the Phillips 66 Pasture and Forage Plants book that's right, an oil company used to put out a book for ranchers who, who hopefully they were going to lease their land from. But look at this uh, drawing. The roots of gay feather can go down as deep as 16 feet. So there's quite a bit of roots still down in the soil over here, even though this much is exposed. Now, here's the difference between dotted gay feather that they're describing here and narrow leaf gay feather. This one's been mowed off with a shredder. Otherwise, it would be tall just like that. Notice the long tapered carrot-like root of narrow leaf and then the more rounded onion-like corm of dotted gay feather. So if you dig one up, you can tell it instantly whether you've got dotted gay feather, which is western half of the state of Texas, narrow leaf, eastern half of the state of Texas. And they'll overlap for 150, 200 miles between Abilene and Weatherford. So sometimes you'll have both. Here's one of our lesser used, but highly desirable landscaping native plants, frog fruit. Especially if you've got rock walls or cascading steps going down rock walls, this plant will grow five and six feet of length and just cascade down those walls, a beautiful plant. Um, the flowers on it, each in, it has a ring of flowers on that flower head. Each flower is no larger than the head of a matchstick. And as these flowers are pollinated and mature, about seven, 10 days later, a new row of flowers opens up and the flower head elongates. Now, one of the ways you can quickly identify frog fruit, look at the leaves. Notice the teeth, coarsely spaced teeth on the outer half of the leaf right here. And the inner half of the leaf is smooth. So that's a good way, plus it's a, uh, an above ground runners, uh, stolons running across the ground. Another name for it is turkey tangle. Some botanist must have seen a turkey get tangled up in it. But again, look at the small flowers. As we go through the summer and the flower heads, flowers mature, the flower head elong, elongates till in the fall, you'll have a flower head a couple inches long, like you see right here. So it's an interesting plant, very showy, flowers all summer. You should grow this one. You could probably look for it in bar ditches and, and uh, you could dig this plant and transplant it. Heath aster, you really got to have your big boy and girl native plant britches on to like this one. This is growing out in the red scalded clay of the rolling plains north of Abilene. Early part of summer, it's got a couple of white flowers, but it's a little scruffy looking, not real showy right now. Midsummer, it begins to look like a tumbleweed, but Heath Aster is hiding its true beauty. And in September and October, this one is a huge plant, but it's got the protection of this old dead cedar skeleton to keep the grazing animals away. So it's able to grow and flourish. But that this plant right here will probably have over a thousand flowers on it, open and available for nectaring and pollen gathering. And the honeybees and other plants that are looking in September and October, trying to make that last bit of uh, pollen gathering, they've hit a gold mine when they find this one. 
trailing ratney. Now, this might not have the most appealing sounding name, but trailing ratney is a very desirable forb. We can call it a wildflower. A broadleaf plant is a forb. Uh, it's not a weed. Uh, back in the 1940s and 50s, ranchers were all about grasses. And all the research that was being done was what kind of grasses can we grow to grow more cattle, grow more beef? This is before wildlife was important, but those early books would mention trailing ratney as a forb that was desirable for cattle. They recognized it and placed it in that book almost as high as a value as those grasses. So to me, it always has a kind of an orchid-like look to the flowers. I'm gonna point these raindrops out. These are natural raindrops. I don't have a spray bottle of water Although I do like that look of the raindrops, but anytime you see a picture of mine and it's got raindrops on it, it's, it's natural raindrops. Now the, the uh, seeds look like goat heads. They're not as sharp as a grass burr. They're more dull tipped, but they're the size of a goat head if you're familiar with that. So you have to be careful to put your knee down on the ground near this plant to observe it. Here's one we dug in Throckmorton County. Uh, look at those roots inch or half inch diameter roots tapering down and we didn't get all the roots but look at the mass of those reddish colored roots and that's a huge plant right there. We've got uh, a couple of morning glories. The one that we have more commonly in our part of the world from Williamson County North is sharp pod morning glory and it's somewhat aggressive kind of weedy Lindheimer's morning glory is a beautiful morning glory. It's native to the hill country and to the western Trans-Pecos, but it will grow in other regions. Uh, Sharp Pod morning glory has three leaf tips. Lindheimer's has five. And here it is growing way up out of its native range in Childress County at my son's house, doing quite well. We've harvested some seed off of that, but here's where it's normally found. So y'all are right there in the ballpark of where it wants to grow. Lindheimer's morning glory. You can't hardly dig one from the roadside in the hill country because it grows in rock, that old hill country soil. Here's a beautiful orange colored plant called orange flame flower. And it does look like flames when you see that at a distance. Here's the close up of the flower. There's nothing bashful about that plant. That is an orange plant, orange flower. The stems come up and then they turn and they just lay on other plants. They're kind of weak. And from about right here forward, this is new growth. Uh, this is old growth. So it's another good, good perennial. Uh, I dug this plant at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. We have a plant quiz there every year when we have one of those uh, workshop field days. And this was on our plant quiz. Uh, it was real sandy soil, so it was easy to dig. I got the root all the way down. So that's probably eight, well, eight inches altogether. This is about five to six inches. Um, and after the quiz was over, I hated to just throw this plant away because it was not one that I got to, got to see very often. So I brought it home in an ice chest, put it in a solo cup of water in my office, kept it in the office for over a month. And it was, like you see here, it was flowering when it was dug. It continued to flower and it matured seeds in that solo cup in my office. These seeds came from that plant. So it's a, uh, it's a neat plant. Here's one that you may want to avoid. I've seen it growing on abandoned railroad tracks in uh, Cameron County. So it grows in your area. Texas nightshade. It is supposedly a poisonous plant. One, one berry will not kill you. I can guarantee you that, or I can vouch for that. But this plant likes to go visit. It spreads by seeds, birds eat the seeds, the berries, and it spreads by underground roots. So it will invade, even though it's native, it will invade your flower bed. That's my hand in the photo. Look how tiny that flower is. The petals, they come outward flat, and then they rotate. So it's a very unique shape to those petals. And that's what caught my eye and why I transplanted some in our yard. My wife doesn't like it and mows it down regularly, but uh, I like to use it for demonstrating uh, plant ID. This pepper shaker 
uh, arrangement of the anthers has heart, uh, slits and it takes buzz pollination by a bee to shake the pollen loose. And as small as this is, the green sweat bees are probably one of the more common pollinators of Texas nightshade. Here's the uh, clusters of ripening fruits. But again, such a tiny little flower. Dutchman's britches. This is an unusual plant. And if we look at it from the side, you start seeing some unusual shaped seed pods. The trick with this plant is you break a branch off, hold it up, ask somebody to smell of it, and it has a citrus odor. It's in the citrus family. And when they smell of it, you ask them, have you ever smelled of a Dutchman's britches? Well, who's gonna answer yes to that? And then you tell them, oh yes, you have, because that is Dutchman's britches. And here's one uh, growing very healthy out around San Angelo, not a great, plant for livestock and deer. So I think you'd be safe putting this where deer have access. And here's that seed pod cluster of pants like pantalones. And I went several years trying to catch this plant in flower. I could always find it looking like this, never could find it in flower. And I had this photo for over a year before I zoomed in and made this enlargement and look right there. The flower is right there. The husk around the flower is the husk around the seeds. Isn't that amazing? But you start noticing all these little dots, the dimples, just like an orange. Uh, Dutchman's britches, being in the citrus family, has that same trait. Here are the seeds. They're uh, shaped like a, that, that orange candy, candy slices that you see around holiday time. Wild bergamot. This is a, a plant that's on the extreme southern edge of its adaptation, if you look on the plant distribution maps, it's more common in the eastern Great Plains, the Mississippi River states, but it does come down into Texas and it's a beautiful plant, but you only get one flower per stalk per year. I've tried cutting them back early, still don't get any regrowth. So one flower per stalk per year. Look at all the little pollinators on this white flower. Occasionally you get white flowers, it's not uncommon. In this clump right here, we had probably a half dozen white flowers that showed up. But out in the pastures, this is real sensitive to moisture. Like a lot of our native wildflowers, if we have a dry winter followed by dry spring, wild bergamot will be a no-show, even though it's perennial, it just won't, won't show up. But a lot of our native plants do that. Now, as I got to harvesting the seed, each one of these was a flower right here. And I wanna show you now under enlargement, what we're gonna look at. This right here is what you're seeing right there, but look at it under enlargement of a microscope. It has these little red dots that I always thought they looked like rubies shining in the light of that microscope, very unusual. I don't know what they are, don't know what the purpose is. Could be that that's part of the smell of this plant because it, has a, it also has a very citrusy smell but it's not in the citrus family. If you're looking for an evergreen shrub, a year round green shrub, then ephedra might be your plant. Now this is not vine ephedra like they have in South Texas. And this is not longleaf ephedra like they have in the Transpacus. This is just plain ephedra, uh, ephedra antisyphilitica. Antisyphilitica, antisyphilis, another name for it is Mormon's tea. Draw your own conclusions. But look at the uh, leaves. You're not gonna see the broad leaf, leaf that you're normally thinking of. These green stems are the leaves that carry on photosynthesis. Here's the old gray bark that's not gonna carry on photosynthesis. But you can also judge how much grazing pressure a pasture is having by looking at ephedra plants. The uh, more you see short little one, two inch stems, three inch stems, that tells you there's a lot of grazing pressure. The cattle and the deer are hitting this plant hard. But if you can see some of these leaves that are six, eight, 10 inches long, that's being managed well. It's not overgrazed and it's not overpopulated with deer. If you wanna to try to collect fruit, you have to be out there in May. Fruit is made in May. It has this three reddish fleshy husk around the seed, which is a football shaped brown seed. Seeds fall on the ground, quail get up under the plants and eat the seeds. So you gotta beat the quail 
to these uh, seeds. I don't, I don't know how easy it'll be to transplant this because by the time you see ephedra, it's always at least the size of a dinner plate or larger. I very seldom see coffee cup sized clumps of ephedra. You just don't notice them. Old man's beard. This is a neat plant from the standpoint of, of what it'll eventually grow into. But this is the early season, new tender growth at the very tips of the stems. If you bite on this, it will have a sharp, peppery, a hot taste. You could put it in a salad. As it begins to flower, each one of these long ons is connected to a seed or a seed to be when it matures. And it always looks like a feather boa back in the old flapper days. And notice this leaf right here, the three-toed leaf. I overheard an ag teacher one time telling his kids, apparently they'd missed this plant on a plant line as part of a contest. And he said, now remember, old man's beard has a leaf like Triceratops or a uh, it was a dinosaur. I can't remember now if it's Triceratops or what. And if you look at that, it does look a little like a dinosaur foot or toes. So he was giving them word associations to help them identify that plant and remember which one it was. Here it is in the late evening, last hour, setting sun, that golden hour of photography. Uh, those ons have gotten really long now, uh, maturing out. And here it is growing in a fence. Now this will tighten up a good fence and it will pull down a, a poor fence. So those, those vines gather and pull, so it will tighten up a fence. Purple leather flower, y'all also down in Williamson County have the scarlet leather flower, the red version of this. They're two separate leather flowers. In the uh, Blackland Prairie of North Central Texas, we have the purple leather flower, but we don't have the red uh, scarlet leather flower growing uh, native. It'll grow in flower beds. But this is a very beautiful flower. Look at that uh, urn vase shaped, very thick walled flower with the tips that curl back. Uh, nice foliage, climbs up on fences and uh, uh, rock columns, very beautiful plant. This is white honeysuckle, another uh, shrub, not the Japanese honeysuckle. This is a native honeysuckle. You'll also see it called bush honeysuckle. This is the largest one I've ever seen, growing between a railroad track and the road highway that you can see uh, beyond the plant. So it was getting protection from cattle, no grazing by cattle, and only the bravest or the dumbest of deer would come out and graze on this plant. Uh, but white honeysuckle, has opposite leaves, except for the terminal leaf, which grows entire and makes one leaf. Here's the green fruit that's developing. If you see it in the spring, you'll often see these new vines twining out from some sort of cedar or live oak thicket or other brush. And it's using that other brush as a hiding spot to grow from and it's sending out new growth into sunlight, but this new growth will often get grazed off. That's how palatable it is. So this is a very palatable uh, shrub. Cattle and deer will certainly eat on it. About the 1st of October, you'll start seeing these red clusters of fruits develop, different numbers of them, depending on how many flowers were pollinated. Uh, you can harvest seed and try to grow it from seed. Uh, I said it always wanted to grow from a brush thicket, not out in the open, but look at this plant. It's growing, granted now, it's growing in a yucca, but this one is behind the Home Depot at Weatherford. It's in a non-grazed area, hadn't had any cattle on it for 30 years probably, but still out in the open, this honeysuckle had to have that yucca to give it early protection so it didn't get grazed down by the deer. So it, it still wants to be hidden at its base. No matter how you pronounce this one, agarita, agarito, or algerita, it's all the same plant. It's a holly looking plant that is evergreen and it has yellow flowers in February. Down where y'all are, it might even be late January when those yellow flowers can be seen. 
And if you get a late hard frost that kills the flowers, you won't make any berries that year, but they'll come back hopefully the next year. <clears throat> the holly-like leaves, are very sharp tipped. They will certainly poke you. The cattle and deer don't graze this plant at all. These red berries were used by early homesteaders to make jams and jellies. They would take a wagon sheet, the tarp that was on their old wagon and spread it around the base of the plant, tuck it up underneath it and take sticks and beat the bushes to knock these berries off and gather them up on that tarp and make jelly. Look on the right side at this one. This is, it looks like it has sharp tips, but I guarantee you this, these leaves are no tougher than tissue paper. They're soft. You can crush them in your hands and it will not poke you. So deer will come along and they'll look for this new tender growth in the spring and they will graze it, but they won't graze after the, after this growth matures, maybe a month, month and a half later, they won't be eating it, but they will eat it when it's young and tender. Here's the last major plant I want to cover, willow leaf sunflower. This is another one of the uh, native perennial sunflowers, much like Maximilian sunflower, this one's native. However, it's known only from five counties in North Central Texas. Again, we're on the very Southern edge of its, adapt, of its native uh, growth. It's more of a Great Plains plant. Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, they've got a lot of it. Uh, this, we were in Knox County, Knox City. Uh, driving down this little ranch road, we were up on a, a saddle between two hills and we saw this plant in August, four or five feet tall in flower. We had to stop and see what it was. I'd seen it once before when it was only about a foot tall in another county and didn't know what it was, didn't recognize it. But we had to figure it out after this. So here we are on that same little saddle and look at what it's growing in. This is called Naco Badlands soil. Scalded rock, scalded clay soils. Look at all the little plants growing and they're, they're green and healthy in August. Next, we drove down the hill and wound up about right here. So I'm gonna show you that one. And here we found it growing again. And this soil is a deep red tight clay called a mangum clay. We've also seen it growing in loams. Um, it's growing now under test at the Knox City Plant Materials Center in Knox City in a uh, sandy loam soil. So we're thinking that this one has got potential to be kind of like Maximilian to come out as a pollinator plant. How good its grazing value is, I don't know. Where we've collected seed in Knox County, uh, cattle were in the pasture while we were there and they weren't, they weren't grazing this plant. So that's a, that's a good thing from a pollinator standpoint, but it makes you wonder how, how palatable it might be or, or not palatable. <coughs> now, this is a bonus. Have you ever seen a fairy ring before? I've seen four of them in my career. And this fairy ring is a large fungus, usually makes a full circle. This is on the golf course in Breckenridge. I'm sure they weren't real proud of it, but this fungus enlarges outward. The circle grows bigger. And as it uses up the humus and the nutrients in the soil during the growth of those mushrooms and that fungus getting larger, as it grows outward, it leaves the inner part of that circle as sort of not sterile, but low in uh, plant value, growth value. It takes a few years for the soil to recover. But this is a fairy ring fungi. And if you look on the internet, there will be several of these. Uh, I used to see them where they were overlapping like the rings of the Olympics, the Olympic rings. But it's a uh, unusual thing. So. Hopefully that will be our end. And if we have any questions, I'll stop sharing and we can take those, uh, take those now. All right, Ricky, we do have a few questions. Um, let, me, let me stop sharing. All my windows went away. So let me bring those back up. Uh, so I do have one question from Dick Davis. Uh, it's regarding trailing rat. Ratony um, mentions that it's parasitic. And if you recommended a host species or, or have you seen it growing with 
specific hooves. Well, I've not heard that it's parasitic, so I don't know. Like when I've seen them growing, they're pretty much dominating a bushel basket size area of ground, and there's nothing else growing there with them. It's not like the paintbrush that's parasitic that has to have a grass to grow on. So right. I'm not, not aware of that. Don't know. Yeah, I haven't heard of that either. Okay. Sorry, Dick. Um, might have to point you somewhere else. More research. <laughs> All right. Um, and then let's see, let me bring up my chat window now. And um, we had a question from Carolyn Fenley. Um, for the plants on your list, um, are there any that you recommend that are more shade tolerant, uh, either shade or dappled shade? Well, that wild bergamot will grow in full sun and it'll grow in the shade of live oak post oaks because we've got it in the front and backyards. One's in full sun, one's in the shade. Um, I didn't show uh, chili patines, but they will grow in the shade and in full sun. Uh, Texas nightshade can grow either way. Um, most of these are adapted to growing in light shade like you'd have with mesquites, that thin foliage of mesquite. So um, the blue funnel lily can grow full sun and in the somewhat shade. Um, there's, there's a lot of plants that will take the shade. Golden, uh, golden crown beard, also called cowpen daisy, is an annual somewhat weedy plant, but a great pollinator. It can take the shade and grow in the sun. Um, Frostweed grows under the sh shade of every oak tree in the hill country, so it can definitely take the shade. Right. So there's there's quite a few. Yeah, and uh, for for Carolyn, we also have a plant list on our website. I'll, I'll throw the link up here in the comments in just a second. Um, but you can I see look through that list. Statement there about the ratney associated with chris oak bush. Well, in the rolling plains and cross timbers, mm -hmm. we don't have chris oak bush, but we have trailing ratney. So it may uh, may have that association in the south southwest, but not in north and north central Texas. Okay, it's good that you could see that for some reason. I'm not seeing his name. Up. That's, that's <laughs> it just says from blank on mine. That's interesting. Okay. It's incognito today. There he goes. Um, okay. And then uh, let's see. Uh, Todd Phillips, sources for online plant or seed purchases. Uh, typically what we recommend as a chapter is Native American seed for seeds. You can also get some, uh, um, some of the grasses will come as, as live plants. Right. Uh, Native American seeds, a great choice. They've got a lot of, a lot of variety. Uh, you can also shop around in the spring and the fall for these native plant society chapter plant sales. They'll be potted plants, but the, you'll, you'll get some good plants that you maybe not be able to find in all, uh, all nurseries. Right. And we haven't started doing online sales, but I know some of the other chapters have been doing some things like that where you can order nice. and then pick up. Has a great sale. Yep. Yeah. And have they been doing online? Do you know? Um, I don't know. They had a sale this fall, but it was uh, so many people, only so many allowed at a time. And But you can get their list ahead of time and mark off the ones you want to find. And it's a pretty easy way to shop for them. Right. All right. Um, and then Nancy Payne has a question about uh, frog fruit. Uh, will the sun requirements, can it take full shade and or full sun? I'll say uh, definitely yes on full sun. Full sun and about the only time we see it in the shade is growing and, and it likes to grow in, uh, if you see it out in a pasture, look for a depressed area, a little two or three, four inch depressional area. Go walk around in that because it likes to be where there's a little extra water running to. And normally those areas are in somewhat sunny to partial sun, partial shade. It wouldn't, it wouldn't want to grow in uh, heavy shade at all. So put it where it's going to get some sun or at least for part of the day. Okay. And then uh, we'll take just uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, someone asked how tall does twist leaf yucca grow? Um, uh, 
think it's, Randy may want to answer that, but I think it's about like the pale yucca and about four to five feet. The stalk. Yeah. You know, the, the right. Are we including the bloom or just the plant itself? The, uh, the, the stalk and the bloom. The, <laughs> right. uh, the leaves itself, probably 18 to 24 inches, 18 inches maybe. Yeah, I would agree with that, at least the ones growing in my yard. And then uh, last question here from Kay Lowry. Uh, any tips to get white or purple clovers to germinate? So I'm in prairie areas, but haven't been able to, to get them to germinate. You probably should do a little research and try to find the right rhizobium inoculant to go with them. And if you, if you wanted to ask somebody that would probably know, I would suggest calling Brandon Carr, C-A-R-R, at the Knox City Plant Material Center. You, you can look it up under uh, natural resource. If you just call the Natural Resources Conservation Service office in Knox City, one of the extensions goes to the Plant Material Center. And he would probably be able to look it up and tell you which rhizobium would be appropriate. Because it does need uh, that bacteria to, to, uh, or to help it get going. We planted this in the uh, mid nineties at Abilene when uh, on CRP land, Conservation Reserve Program land that was cropland going back to grass, taking it out of production, planting it to native grasses. And we would plant a forb to get extra points for the landowners like if they wanted to plant the forb. And we used Maximilian sunflower. Well, one year Maximilian was just sold out. And we went to purple and white prairie clover because they had the same exact seeding rate, three pounds per acre all three of them. And what we saw was hit or miss. Uh, some fields would get a stand of prairie clover, another field a couple miles down the road wouldn't. And it, so it, there's a little, it's a little troublesome to try to get it up. But I think if you can ever get it started and get that rhizobium uh, to work for you, it would, uh, it would grow fine. Okay, that's really good advice. I wouldn't have thought of that. Okay. I like what Mary Ann's saying about frog fruit there. I see that. Uh, she's got it growing uh, in heavy shade. Is that is that the right one? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's Cindy. growing in a ditch. Right above. Cindy says it's growing in deep shade in her yard in Georgetown. So I didn't know it would take that much shade. But good to know. Okay, yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I think that's all the time that we have. Uh, Ricky, thank you so much. I enjoy uh, it. Randy, is there anything that you want to add before we close out? Uh, no, Gary. I, uh, I appreciate your coming tonight, Ricky, and I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Even though we couldn't do it in person, this is kind of next best thing. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. It's good. All right. Uh, thanks for everyone that attended. Uh, it'll take us a few days and we'll have this posted to our YouTube channel. You'll be able to watch there. I'll also make sure that I've got the link for the PDF and I'll toss up that link for uh, the Williamson County chapters uh, uh, plant list that we have that you can search on based on deer resistance and uh, light requirements, that sort of thing. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you all. All right, and good night. Right.